Hi, my name is Henry Smith, co-host of Digging for Truth, sponsored by the Associates for Biblical Research. Today, joining us in the studio is Gary Byers, professional archaeologist and assistant director of the excavations at Shiloh in Israel. Today, we'll be talking about exciting discoveries related to Egypt and the Bible. We hope you find it fascinating and interesting. Well, Gary, before we start talking about archaeology, which is why we're here today, it's exciting to talk about biblical archaeology. Um, why don't you share with us a little bit about your background? How did you come to ABR? Why did you come to ABR? What about ABR is, uh, is special? Uh, I grew up, uh, my dad gave me a real love for history. I just, mm -hmm. I just loved history. And uh, when I became a believer in my first year of college, my interest in history transferred to the biblical world. Mm -hmm. My second year of college, uh, I went to Bible college, prepared for ministry, and uh, started a church in Frederick, Maryland uh, when I was 22 years old. And too young to know better, but God worked in yes. spite of me and all my issues. Mm -hmm. And as a pastor, I, I, um, I wanted to teach the Bible better to people. I wanted people to get more familiar with Bible people. Mm -hmm. And I thought archaeology would be a good way to do it. So I started studying it, wound up at um, uh, Baltimore Hebrew University, got a graduate degree there in archaeology, and uh, that really became my deal. And then uh, as a pastor, and then I ran into Bryant Wood, and uh, I, I won't say that Bryant talked me out of the pastorate, but uh, <laughs> Bryant uh, challenged me with some things, and I really did. And it was, it was the culmination of feeling a call from God yes. to take my ministry calling and work to another level. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I did. I wound up after 18 years leaving the full-time pastoral ministry and mm -hmm. uh, started working with, mm -hmm. with uh, ABR back in those days on the staff and then later with the board of directors and been digging with Bryant and other ABR staff now for uh, about uh, 30 years. Yeah. Well, I, it's interesting. You've worn many hats at ABR. You've probably worn all the hats. Just about. Yeah. <laughs> right. And uh, today, you're, uh, what's, your, what's your official title today? Uh, today, I'm, um, I, I, t I am the uh, assistant director at two excavations in yep. the Holy Land, one yep. in Israel, one in Jordan. Yep. And yep. Uh, it's a, just a, a real privilege to get to, to, to be there and do that. And it's really cool to get to talk about it with you guys. Yeah. It's awesome. Now, Gary, uh, a few years back, when you and I had more hair, in 2005 <laughs> and 2008, we went somewhere else. We didn't go to Israel or Jordan, but we went to Egypt. Yeah. We had a study tour that we had done back then uh, before some of the political instability yes. had happened in Egypt. And uh, we, we put together uh, a fantastic uh, tour of, of Egypt. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about Egypt in this segment. Uh, but you wanted to share, uh, we got to see a lot of great things on this tour, and one of the things that everyone sees when they go to Egypt is the Sphinx yeah. and the pyramids. So yeah. let's yeah. begin with our talk about Egypt, about, about that. Sh share with uh, what you have in mind with that. Yeah, please. well, you know, one of the, one of the uh, seven wonders of the ancient world were the pyramids, oldest by far of that list of seven, and the only one still standing. It's just phenomenal. It's amazing. And yeah. I... As an archaeologist, I think we understand how they were, were, were made, but I, they're so amazing. I understand why people think spacemen had to do it, because it was just, they are just amazing. <laughs> yeah. But we don't think we needed spacemen, and, uh, and so it wasn't necessary. And so the pyramids are, are made of stone, constructed of stone, and, and the quarries are, are fairly close by, a few miles. And uh, the Sphinx is actually carved out of just a little stone plateau, it is the Giza Plateau, which is stone, and it's covered now with, with sand, but they, there was a little hump, and uh, 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 the pharaoh decided to uh, create that little hump into a, a little uh, figure uh, with a, a man's head and a lion's body, and so that's there, and then the pyramids were built, uh, and that the, the, the Sphinx, mm -hmm. Sphinx was supposed to guard the area, and the pyramids were built as tombs for the pharaohs, and they're, they're just phenomenal. And so, as I've taught about this over the years, uh, 
and I don't mean to oversimplify the Egyptian religion, but basically the pyramids were built for the pharaoh to have a, a good burial, thus a good afterlife. Mm -hmm. And if the pharaoh had a good afterlife, it could help hook the rest of us up who lived <laughs> in the kingdom. So the entire kingdom would invest itself for as long as the pharaoh was alive to get his pyramid built, hoping that the brother would have a good afterlife, <laughs> so hopefully it could hook me up for a good afterlife. Yeah. <laughs> and that's kind of what they did. And actually, they bankrupt the, the kingdom after the first two pyramids. Uh, the third one, it was half the size because they couldn't afford it. They couldn't afford it. it yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. And so, so all of that work to help the, hook the pharaoh up in his afterlife, hoping it'll spill over for me, and then you compare that to what we do as believers. Mm -hmm. um, we can't do enough good to go to heaven. Yeah, we can't yeah, do yeah, enough good, good to get ourselves there. And so to spend your, invest your entire life to get this guy's tomb ready, hoping it'll work out for him, hoping it'll work out for me, and all I have to do is admit that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior, and I believe that's who Jesus is. What a great deal. Yeah, that's, that's a, right. I, like, that's I really right. like that illustration, Gary. You know, when I got off the bus the first time in 2005 and saw the pyramids, Usually something gets hyped up and you're disappointed. I, and they actually took my breath away when I got off the bus. They were so enormous. It really, really is. They're really tremendous achievement. Shows you the intelligence uh, of man, ancient yeah. man. Yes. Um, it, it re really, really quite incredible they are. Yeah. It also shows you the level of idolatry, doesn't it? Yeah. What people will go to. Yeah. To build yeah. such edifices like that yeah. for the afterlife but it's really all about human effort is yeah. what you're talking a about. A form of justification by works in a way. Yeah, it right? Is. right, it right. Was. Even though they're working for the Pharaoh, <clears throat> sort of the Pharaoh is the redeemer, isn't he? Yeah. Of the yeah. people who are alive. There's very interesting theology there. Um, you yeah. know, obviously it's an idolatrous one, but there, there's, a, there's a connection for sure. Yeah, yeah. well people today, they get so enamored by Egyptian ideas and their culture and their art and all those things. And it is fascinating, but they get caught up in yeah. the philosophical part of it, which is a distraction. And what you said, Gary, about Christ being our, our only Savior. We don't work to get ourselves to heaven. Jesus has paid, paid the price for us. That's Hallelujah. awesome. Amen. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Welcome back to Digging for Truth. Today we've been having a discussion in studio with Reverend Gary Byers, who's a professional archaeologist and assistant director of the excavations at Shiloh. We've been talking about discoveries in Egypt related to the Bible and how the discoveries verify and authenticate the history of the scriptures. We hope you enjoy this next segment. regards to Egypt, of course, uh, we're interested in seeing the interaction between uh, Egypt, ancient Egypt, and the Bible. Yeah. And uh, sometimes people will say, well, you know, where did Israel fit in to the Egyptian history? They, they see all these really cool, um, you know, the pyramids and all these really, really cool things, and they, they wonder, how does this all connect? And so some of the evidence is a little bit more obscure. Uh, and there's a couple of examples uh, I would like us to talk about today. Uh, and um, the, one, um, the one artifact is the Berlin pedestal and also the Renepta Stila. And these are actually uh, amazing discoveries mm -hmm. that speak of Israel. And so we can see that there is a, a very uh, definite, uh, these historical artifacts speak of Israel 
and establish the reality that outside of the Bible, we have testimony. Yeah. So Gary, maybe you could talk about those two uh, particular artifacts. Yeah, well, the, uh, the first one, the, the Berlin pedestal, it's, it's, um, it was actually purchased in Egypt as, as, a, as a piece of antiquity. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's about uh, 16 inches by 18 inches by about three inches thick. And it, it's not a pedestal for anything by mm-hmm. itself. Mm-hmm. But what it is made it very clear to the archaeologists that this had been cut off. Somebody in, in modern days, we're sure, chopped this thing off on the back side. So they got edges in the top and the back, all cut this piece out, this piece out. And it's, it's, um, it's got three... Uh, captives mm-hmm. we're very familiar with this art pharaoh would would do a a campaign into some country he'd uh, defeat a lot of enemies or at least he said he defeated a lot of enemies <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and he would come back and do this monument and it would be on a temple mm-hmm. and it was always to to his god uh, thanking his god for his victories that he had and so they would have these these rows of captives that they had defeated and each captive mm-hmm. um, uh, they all look the same in Cyril Palestine, Canaan. Uh, they all look the same in in southern uh, Africa. They all look the same, and mm-hmm. you can tell the difference. You know, yeah, they're they're, yeah. they're different people, and so they have this 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 appearance. Uh, it's a it's a man's head, long hair, full beard, uh, and a headband, and that's the standard look for these Cyril Palestinians. And then um, his torso is actually an oval that's supposed to depict, we think, the wall of a city. Mm-hmm. And then um, he's, he's got arms coming out of the, 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 the oval, and they're tied behind his back. Mm-hmm. And there's a rope looped around his neck that goes to the figure in front of him mm-hmm. and goes to the figure back of him. So he's clearly a captive, a defeated foe. Mm-hmm. And so this, this one pedestal base that's in the Egyptian Museum in Berlin, this, just this one piece, it's got three of these captives, all Syro Palestinian guys. And on the first one, you can read the name in the in the oval, and, and it and it says Ashkelon, the, the, the city of Ashkelon was a Canaanite city that later became a Philistine city, one of the five cities of the Philistine Pentapolis. Hmm. Then then the um, uh, uh, the next one talks about uh, Canaan, hmm. and then the last one, it's broken and you can't see it, the one on the end. And uh, it was, it was um, translated from, from Egyptian hieroglyphics to German and then, of course, known to English. And uh, a few years back, as they were working through this, one of the scholars said, you know, I think that last one says Israel. Hmm. And, um, and that was quite a deal because people, people um, well, first, first there's some argument, of course. There's always yeah, argument. Yeah. Like any time right. you connect any of this stuff, you just dare connect it to the Bible. People say, oh, no, it can't be. Can't do oh, that. no, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and we'll, I guess we'll get to talk about some more of these things. Yeah, but it's just yeah. amazing. There's such a clear Bible connection, but it can't be. It can't be the Bible because you can't really trust the Bible for that old stuff. So it must be something else. But uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good chance. And, and scholars who really work on this stuff, especially hieroglyphics, I, I think it really could be. And so yeah. we think we have a reference. Uh, and and we, we think that the inscription would be dated about the, uh, the middle or the late 15th century, mm-hmm. which B.C., which means it's the time of the Exodus or a little later. Mm-hmm. And it just looks like there may be a reference to in Syro-Palestine, a reference to the fact that the Israelites were some of the people that were there at that time. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. That's an awesome discovery. And that discovery was kind of obscure for many, many years. Yes. I understand it sat in the museum yeah. for a long time, and they, oh, this is yeah. a pretty important discovery. It was sort of rediscovered in the basement, I think, yeah. rediscovered, right? Yeah. It's an interesting thing about archaeology. Yeah. That's a whole project for archaeologists to do, is to go to old museums and find stuff that was discovered. That's mm-hmm. really important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, Gary, tell us a little bit more about the Merneptah Stela then. How does that? I think. The Merneptah steel is a little bit more clear. Yes, and that was then that really makes this other one really, really say, yeah, this this really does make sense. The yeah. Merneptah steel is um, it's about about ten feet tall, 
mm -hmm. uh, about four or five feet wide, four feet wide, I guess. And it's a massive stone monument, and it was carved by King uh, Pharaoh Menepta, and it was celebrating, uh, again, his campaigns, his victories, the wonderful mm -hmm. things that he's done. <laughs> and at the bottom, almost as an add-on, is a, is a couple of lines uh, about uh, a campaign he did in Canaan, um, mm -hmm. maybe about, um, about uh, 12, uh, 12 BC, something like that. It would be during the time of the judges. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. he, he says there, uh, again he mentions Ashkelon, um, and immediately he mentions Canaan, this Pharaoh does, and then he mentions, and it's real clear there, he makes a reference to Israel. And he says, Israel's, Israel is, is no longer, Israel is wasted, his seed is no more. Now, his seed could, could actually refer to family, but it, it could very well receive, refer to his crops. We've, mm -hmm. we've destroyed his crops, he'll never survive again, it's over. Now this is in the time of the judges. Pharaoh, Egyptian Pharaoh says, I went into the Holy Land, I, uh, the land of Canaan, I defeated everybody that was there, and I wasted them, and particularly he mentions I wasted Israel. Yeah, and then the significance of these finds is just affirming in these extra biblical, um, in stone, extra biblical information about Israel. So no, no one can say that Israel didn't exist, or they weren't known, or they were a little tribal, little tribal group uh, with, no, with no real country status, nation status. They were known, yes. so it's important. Yeah. So along the same lines, you know, we have the, okay, so we've got the Berlin pedestal, the Bernepta Stila, and then we have this amazing discovery, uh, the Amarna letters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I wanna, I wanna ask you about that. So I'll set the stage for that. Uh, in the book of Joshua, uh, after the Israelites conquer the land, it, it lists a whole bunch of kings. I think it's 31 or something like that, right? So it's showing the, the structure, the political structure of Canaan at that time. It lists all these little kings. And then we find in Egypt these letters called the Amarna letters. Uh, if you could share about what they are and how they connect to Joshua, what I just described. Yeah. Well, uh, the Amarna letters, they are little tablets. And we've been talking about big monuments. The little clay tablets, just, just this size, uh, incised in cuneiform script, and, uh, and, and it was Egyptian language, but in this cuneiform script, and um, uh, these are actually, each one of these little, little tablets, clay tablets, is a letter either from the Pharaoh in Egypt, a copy of what he sent to them in Canaan, these little kings of all these little kinglets, or most of them are the letters from those kings to the Pharaoh in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And it was, his capital uh, was at Amarna at that time. And uh, these were then dug up in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, these have been dug up there in that, the ruins of the capital. And so mm -hmm. uh, there, are, there are these letters, a number of them refer to this group of people in the Holy Land, in Canaan, uh, during the time of the Book of Judges, and, and it, they're referred to as the Habiru. And, and they're, um, they are a problem in the land to these local kings. And they're, they're saying to Pharaoh, uh, well, first off, the local kings are always fighting with each other. They're always mad at each other. And then they're talking about this group of people that's come in from the outside, and they're a problem. And, and so um, the king of Jerusalem actually sends five letters uh, uh, and every one of them, he says, these people are, are an, a problem to me. Pharaoh, give me some help, send some troops mm -hmm. or some money, something, and I can take care of these people because they're a real problem to me. Well, the word habiru is very similar to the word Hebrew. You can hear it. And linguistically, they, they really fit. And so we have a, a, the right name describing a group of people. Now, the word habiru is used in the ancient world. That word is used elsewhere in other places. So habiru and Hebrew are similar words, but in, in this particular place, at this particular time, such a group of people from the outside, not settled, but wandering through, it, it just seems to fit exactly what the Bible says. Uh, right people, right place, right time. Right time. Yeah. Doesn't say the word Israel, but actually uses a word that really relates directly to yeah. the, the word Hebrew. And that yeah, word, when it was more broadly used, to, 
in the ancient Near East beyond this particular yes. area. It was to refer to like bandits, marauders, yep. which is nomadic what, people. Nomadic yes. people, which is what the Canaanites would yeah. see the Israelites as yep. external invaders trying to take yeah. over the land. So it really fits the context. It really does. Yeah. That's, that's excellent. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Welcome back to Digging for Truth. We've been having an exciting discussion about Egypt and the Bible with our friend and archaeologist, Gary Byers. Gary is the Assistant Director of the Excavations at Biblical Shiloh. We've been talking about discoveries that relate the Bible to ancient Egypt, the great land out of which came the Israelites in the ancient days. We hope you enjoy this next segment. Well, Gary, maybe briefly uh, uh, we could talk a little bit about the Shishak inscription. Uh, if you could give us a little bit of information about that, I'm sure um, you know there are many who will never have heard of something like that, but it's an important discovery. Yeah, another pharaoh, Pharaoh Shishak in, uh, in Egypt, the, uh, the, the temple of Amun in Luxor, yeah. uh, Thebes and Luxor, one side of the river or the other, uh, Thebes is really where the, uh, the tombs of all the pharaohs are, King Tut's tomb, and then the temples are on the other side at the, at the, the city, capital city of Luxor. And there at the temple of Amun, the main god for most of the Egyptian pharaohs, uh, on, the out, on the south side of the great court, when you come into the place, there's this massive um, relief carved by Pharaoh Shishak, and he's, um, same thing, got all these captives, got 105 of them mm -hmm. all lined up. They're all Cyril Palestinians, same look, same people. And, and um, down at the, at the bottom, uh, uh, a little bit below where Pharaoh's standing, is a, um, are, are two of them that uh, they're no longer, you, if, and I've been there, they're no longer there now, but when they were first uncovered, they, they, they copied all this stuff down, everybody, they got this, and, uh, and it, there's, there's two of them together that okay. seem to refer to a, a place in southern Palestine called the Heights of David. The, the Heights of David, what David? David who? <laughs> you know, we think we know, and this is Pharaoh Shishak, who's, who uh, is uh, uh, coming into the land about uh, 50, 60 years after King David was ruling, mm. and David's son Solomon had ruled. And so yes. the Heights of David seems to fit another reference, I think, in the 10th century to uh, the, the rule of King David, which there's some other things to talk about him as well. So there is evidence in Egypt. It's, it's not big stuff, mm -hmm. but there's stuff that Israel was in the land, the Egyptians knew it, and every a little bit of stuff even that Israel was in Egypt and the, the Egyptians yes. acknowledge it. Okay. So, as a, so as a summary, you know, we, we just hit on four quick discoveries, right? I mean, this is like bang, bang, bang. But really, this is the kind of thing we're looking for. We don't, we're, we're not going to have complete affirmation of what the Bible says about these, yeah. these matters, but we have these snapshots, we do. the Berlin pedestal the time of the Exodus, the Merneptah Stila, the Judges period, the Shishak inscription, the time of David, and then the Amarna letters describing the political situation yeah. in Canaan yes. very much fits the descriptions found in the book of Judges. Again, when we dig in the ground in the world of archaeology, what we find, not to no surprises to us, uh, that it affirms what the scriptures teach us. We're grateful that you joined us today for this episode of Digging for Truth, where we discuss the relationship between the Bible, the Old Testament, and the country of Egypt. 
the Israelites living there in the land, and the recognition that Israel was a real people living in the ancient world. Gary Byer showed us various pieces of evidence that show the biblical accounts are reliable as it relates to Egypt. Thank you for joining us today.